that? No, no, I was just turning on recording. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, in uh, this talk of two students learning seminar, we have a picture of a work from M Math first year. He'll give a talk on unimodularity and the geometry of random groups. Ritvik, uh, please start. Uh, um, thanks for giving me this opportunity. So I'll um, start right away. So um, before I start, I'd just like to mention that uh, although there is like a 10 minute question and answer session at the end, if you have any quick clarifications, short questions, uh, you could just unmute and stop me and ask whatever you want to. And if there are any uh, lengthier or bigger questions, so more involved, then we can deal with them later at the end of the uh, Okay, so I'll start. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about unimodularity and the geometry of random graphs. So let's begin. Right. Uh, so here's our convention. Throughout these slides, G will always denote a connected, countable, and locally finite graph. So what do I mean by that? So by connected graph, I mean that if I take any two vertices, then there is going to be a finite edge path connecting them. By countable, I know I mean countable infinite. And by locally finite, I essentially mean that uh, the degree of every vertex is finite. So as a consequence, if you take in, if you choose any vertex and construct a small uh, and construct integer valued balls at about that uh, vertex point, then the number of points inside this ball is also going to be finite. Hence, locally fine. And our graphs will be nice. That is, uh, they'll be undirected and there'll be no self loops. That is, there's, there's going to be no edges starting and ending at the same vertex. Now, having done that, we can lay down a metric on our graphs in the standard way. That is, given any point, any, any two uh, vertices x and y, or in particular, any two points, uh, we declare the distance between them to be the length of the shortest edge path joining these two points, let's say x and y. So in particular, if you have two vertices, then just count the smallest number of edges that you need uh, to join x to y. Anyways, so right. So we begin with the question. Suppose I give you a graph G, and I ask you to give me subgraphs at random. So what would you do? So well, if you could give me a probability measure on the set of all subgraphs of G, I'd be really happy. Right? But here's another naive and easy way to do this, which gives us a very interesting model to start working on. So what, would, what we do is that we list all the edges of my graph G. There are countably many of them, as you know. And uh, we start going through them. And each time I encounter an edge, I toss a coin independently to decide if I want to leave it in my graph or remove it, pick it up. Right? So at the end of this process, I'm going to get a subgraph, right? And well, I have produced a random subgraph, right? But this has some distribution. So let's see what it looks like. So formally, so let G be a graph, its vertex set being V, its edge set being E. And choose some para survival parameter P. I'm calling it a survival parameter, we'll see why, between zero and one. So percolation configuration on G is an element of all uh, zero one sequences indexed by E. So you, you could think of it in this way that for each edge in my graph, uh, I associate a value zero or one, right? And any such sequence is going to be called a percolation configuration. Now, given any such percolation configuration, there is a very standard way in which we can associate a subgraph, right? So I'll take the vertex set of my graph, right? And what are, what is what are, what are the edges of my subgraph? It's precisely going to be given by the edges that figure up in my sequence. What do I mean by that? So I retain an edge, E, let's say, if the corresponding entry in my sequence is one, and I call such an edge open. Why? Because I can traverse through it, right? In the subgraph that I open. And if the corresponding entry is zero, then I call this edge closed because I can't travel through it. So that gives me such a subgraph. Now I equip zero comma one with the Bernoulli P probability measure. That means that uh, probability that 
uh, you take the value one is going to be equal to p, and the probability that you take the value zero is going to be one meter p. So, having done that, Bernoulli p percolation on this graph G is essentially this measure space over here. I hope you can see my cursor. So, what is my so 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 uh, what is the set on which I'm laying down my measure? So, it's basically the set of all percolation configurations. Note that these are essentially going to be subgraphs of my graph G. I equip it with a sigma algebra. The sigma algebra is nothing but the product sigma algebra. And the product measure coming from all these Bernoulli P uh, probability measures. Right? So let's just recall what that means in case anyone is, someone is not familiar. So, so the sigma algebra F is essentially generated by these cylinder sets of the form uh, 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 an E indexed product of sets AE, where AE is going to be equal to 0, 1 for all but finitely many years, right? So that so what does that basically mean? So any such cylinder is essentially going to be the collection of all these uh, uh, percolation configurations in which I know that let's say some finitely many, like k many edges are open, some n minus k many uh, edges are closed, and the rest of the edges can be anything, we don't know. And what is the probability that uh, I end up picking up a subgraph that belongs to the cylinder? Precisely given by this uh, p to the power k times one minus p to the power n minus k, right? Okay, so having done that, now some uh, notation essentially. So uh, well, once you have taken some percolation configuration, so uh, you're going to have connected components, right? So you call these connected components clusters. And given any vertex X, the connected component that it belongs to is called the cluster of X, which is denoted by K of X. Now given any vertex X and any edge E, we, we are interested in two distinguished events. So I'll, I call these events, the first one being X connected to E. X connected to E means they denotes the event that uh, the edge E, falls in the cluster containing X. And the second one being the event that X is connected to infinity, which denotes the event, the diameter of the cluster containing X is infinite, which essentially means that the cluster containing X is infinite in size, right? Moreover, define theta P to be the uh, probability with respect to the, uh, the Bernoulli P measure, percolation measure, that X is connected to infinity. So what does essentially measure? That basically means that if once I've once I've chosen my survival parameter p, this basic this theta p spits out the well, spits out the probability. Then what is the probability that given such a vertex x, this word the cluster that that x belongs to is infinite? So right, what what are we talking about? So visually, this is what it looks like. So these black lines that you see are essentially my ambient graph. Let's say capital G. Right? And I've chosen this point over here, X, okay, some, some vertex. So a percolation configuration is essentially going to be the union of these colored lines that you see, right? And whenever you see a color, this denotes an open edge. And when you see no color, this means a closed edge, right? And what is the cluster containing X? It's basic. This is my X, so the cluster containing X is this green, this green component over here. I hope that's clear. Right. Having done that, we let's observe something. So we start with a question. What happens to the structure of a percolation configuration sampled according to uh, my Bernoulli P measure as we slide P from zero to one? Okay. So, uh, so basically what are you doing? As you're increasing your P, you're increasing the chance that a particular edge in your ambient graph is going to be open, right? So as you slide P from zero to one, uh, you could pro you should probably expect that more number of edges keep opening up, right? So that means that in particular, uh, if you started out if you, you start start out with no clusters, right? At t equal to zero, you have no clusters at all because all edges are closed, right? So as you start increasing p, you start seeing small finite clusters emerging up, and these start coalescing as you increase your p, right? So when we talk about structure, we're 
talking about this phenomena. In particular, for instance, what happens to the number of clusters as p goes from 0 to 1? What happens to the size of clusters? What happens to the packing of clusters? That is, how does a mutual arrangement change? Right? So that's what we mean by structure. And in particular, we are also interested in what values this function theta p takes. That is, uh, what is the probability? What happens to the probability that a given vertex x is going uh, is is going to be contained in a cluster that is infinitely large, right? So what can we say about that? So firstly, at p equal to zero, we know that there are no infinite clusters, right? Then the edge is closed. And at p equal to one, there is a unique infinite cluster, namely all of them, right? So therefore, theta one is going to be equal to one. Now, as I said, intuitively, you should expect theta to monotonically increase from zero to one. Right, because as you uh, increase your value of p, you expect more, more and more number of edges to open. And moreover, here's something that uh, maybe could be intuitive to you, but we'll explain this later in any case. That the probability that a given vertex x is contained in an infinite cluster is either zero or one. Right, that basically means that almost surely, if, if you pick up uh, a random subgraph give, sampled according to this Bernoulli p measure, then either x is, I mean, either x is almost surely going to have, uh, uh, going to belong to a finite cluster, or almost surely it's going to belong to an infinite cluster. Right? So let's see if our guess works. These are our guesses. I mean, the first two are clear, the second two are something that we've intuitively guessed. So let's see if it works. Right. So this is something that I was uh, just briefly talking about verbally. So uh, on your, so you have three graphs over here, right? So this is essentially these are patches of uh, the Euclidean lattice set. Too. Okay, you can think about it like that. And uh, so, so as you start increasing p, so as you start increasing p from zero to one, you see that these clusters. So each cluster has been shown by uh, a different color over here. So they start coalescing. So increase P, you see that they start merging together and forming bigger and bigger clusters. And then if you go higher, you see that you end up encountering an infinite cluster. This is the pink one over here on the far right side. So let's see what, what's happening. Let's try to uh, quantify what's happening in these pictures. Okay. So I'm gonna describe what's called the monotone coupling. So what we'll do is do that we'll couple all these Bernoulli p probability measures in such a way that as p increases, for sure more edges open up. Okay, so we're just trying to quantify the intuition that I said before. So for that we need some uh, smart terminology. So let A be any event that is it's going to be any uh, measurable collection of subgraphs. We say that A is an increasing event. If for any two configurations omega and omega prime and uh, uh, omega and omega prime, such that omega is contained in omega prime. Whenever omega falls in A, omega prime is also falls in A. So A is in some sense upper closed with respect to these configurations. So what are some examples? So consider the events, event that a particular edge, edge E is open. So as you can as you can probably see usually rather clearly, so if you take any percolation configuration in which the edge E is open, then uh, no matter how many more edges you open up, right, the edge E is still going to be open, right? So therefore it's an increasing event. And more important examples are these canonical events, that is X is connected to an edge E, X is connected to infinity, right? And uh, they are increasing to the same level. So moving on ahead, so this is the first result that we want to talk about. So there exists a probability measure P on this space, two to the power E raised to the interval zero, the unit interval zero one, with marginals being the Bernoulli P probability, uh, Bernoulli, Bernoulli P pro population probability measures, such that whenever I have any two uh, parameters P and P prime, with P strictly less than P prime, then the probability that uh, the pupils omega and omega prime says that omega is contained in omega prime is going to be equal to one. So in fact, I mean, this encodes the intuition that we're talking about in here. 
that uh, has been increased to for sure more edges open we'll see that more precisely right so how do we do this i'll just give us quick outline so uh, we couple them via some uh, a collection of uniform zero one valued random variables so in particular for each edge e let u of e be a zero one valued uniform random variable and uh, you take uh, an e indexed set of these random variables all of them being independent and not only with respect to each other but also independent with respect to all these ordinary p meters now for each p define the configuration omega p by setting omega p to be equal to the indicator function that uh, u of e is less than equal to p what that means is that so u of e so these sequences of uh, random variables basically gives you a bunch of labels right on your edge set so it's a, a zero one valued label on all of your edges so uh, how do you form this configuration you visit each edge you look at the label if it is less than equal to p you include it in your graph if it's greater than p you don't right now quickly observe that if p is less than p right then obviously this configuration omega p is going to be contained in omega p so the mean is equal to and it's easy to see that the law of omega p so omega p is really random variable yeah? the law of omega p is exactly going to be uh, p p sub p which is the bernoulli p perturbation method and then we simply declare capital p to be the law of small p going to omega p so this satisfies our requirements right so now we can quickly utilize this theorem to uh, encode our intuition so let a be an increasing event right then the function small p going to the uh, bernoulli p probability that a occurs is a monotonically increasing function so in particular note that uh, once we have proved this we know that the event that x is connected to infinity is an increasing event right so this in, this in fact gives a proof of, of the fact that theta p is a monotonically increasing function as you slide p from 0 to right so why is this cool it's very easy you take any two parameters p and p prime so that p is less than p prime then the bernoulli p probability that a occurs is since uh, since p p is the uh, is a marginal of capital p we know that capital we know that pp that a occurs is exactly equal to the probability that omega p belongs to a but since we know that uh, almost surely omega p is contained in omega p prime uh, when p is less than p prime uh, this just follows from monoton monotonicity of the probability measure and then again this is equal to pp prime of a by the fact that this is nothing but the marginal probability that's a very short and easy proof right so this basically tells us that theta p is indeed monotonically increasing right so we have we have essentially given a short proof of this third of guess over here for the fourth case you just need to check that the event that x is connected to infinity is a tail event and then you can use a kolmogorov zero one law argument to easily show that theta p is going to be zero or one But yeah, we won't spend much time. Okay, so this is essentially part of our setup. So since so since we now know that theta p monotonically increases from zero to one, so therefore it makes sense to talk about the supremum of all the values of p such that theta p equal to zero. So what I really mean is that if you try and plot theta p. Uh, uh, on zero comma one, then you'll see that it starts at zero, it remains at zeros, and then there is this critical probability, which we denote by PC of G, where a phase transition occurs, and my graph jumps to one, right? So what is happening there? So below PC G, all my clusters were finite, right? And after PC, I have infinitely many clusters in my Uh, randomly, I mean, uh, in my uh, in in any population configuration that I choose, right? But of course, the mystery is that what happens at the phase transition, right? At the phase transition, what is happening? I mean, does do you suddenly end up coalescing a really large number of uh, finitely many clusters into a big, large, infinite cluster, or at PC, do you in fact have 
uh, infinitely many finite clusters, which are probably arranged in a very, you know, uh, fractal like way. So I'm not going to say what I mean by a fractal like way, but I guess you can guess what that looks like, right? So anyway, PC is called a critical probability, right? So having established this, we have some quick questions. Yeah. What is the meaning of theta yeah, p? Ahead. Ah, theta p is the probability that uh, so you fix some vertex x in your graph g. Okay. Theta p is the probability that uh, x is uh, that the, the the cluster of x is infinite in size. Is that clear? And um, what is the meaning of that X is connected to infinity? This means that, so uh, once you take, I hope you know what, a, uh, you're clear about what a percolation configuration is. It's just a subgraph of my graph G. So you take any point, the, any vertex X. So the cluster of X is the connected component of X, right? So I say that X is connected to infinity if the connected component in which x belongs to, that is the cluster of x, has infinite diameter. Okay. Right. So some quick questions. For which graphs do we have a non-trivial phase transition? Right. What do I mean by that? I mean that, uh, so this PC of G, when does it lie between zero, strictly between zero and one? For all you know, it could be equal to one. Right. We'll see a very trivial example of when it's equal to one. Moreover, is it a tractable task to compute PC of G for some nice enough graphs or let's say some important class of graphs? Moreover, uh, we saw what we saw, we have some sort of guess of what happens beyond PC, but what happens to the number of infinite clusters? So we know that below PC, it's zero. You, have, you always have five infinite clusters, but what happens beyond PC? How many infinite clusters can you? And as I had, I just briefly described a few minutes ago, what happens at PC? What's the rate at which finite clusters coalesce to give infinite clusters? Okay. And uh, so in particular, if you are, let's say, when your G is equal to a Euclidean lattice, then uh, is your probability distribution at, uh, uh, at, at P equal to PC a conformally invariant. In particular, for example, it does, is it invariant under scaling transformations like x going to lambda x? Is it, it's, is it invariant under small rotations? Right? If you rotate your lattice, it's, it's still going to give the same probability distribution, etc. So this conformal invariance in particular is just <clears throat> something that physicists have separated. And very recently, uh, 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 Hugo, Dominic, Popan, Popan has given a formula, proof of this. Anyway, so there are many more uh, questions, right? So the important point, we won't be answering all these questions right now, but the important point is that in answer, these are very fair. First thing is that these are fairly natural questions to ask. And second is that it turns out that in answering the above, two important dichotomies emerge. That is whether the graph is amenable or not, and whether the graph is unimodular or not. So from now on, we'll, uh, we'll, I mean, we'll aim to understand what amenability of a graph is, what unimodularity of a graph is, and then, as I had uh, 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 as I had promised in my abstract, I tried to ask some basic geometric questions about my graph and see what I can do about them. Right. Right. So, uh, just to give you some idea of uh, uh, of, the, of our model, which is Bernoulli percolation, here are some answers and examples. So, firstly, it's actually really easy to see that P C for Z is going to be equal to one. Okay. So, uh, in fact, if you just draw it, it's going to be clear because uh, so, so so Z is basically looks like a straight line, right? So the point is, is that let's say you fix uh, X to be equal to zero, right? And you want to check if uh, uh, for some value of P between strictly between zero and one, zero lies in an infinite cluster or not. Okay. Now, the thing about these, this Bernoulli P percolation is that it's the measure is tolerant with respect to inserting and deleting finitely many edges. Okay, that means that if I take some percolation, uh, if I take some uh, random percolation configuration, right, and I, I look at the cluster containing zero, and if I remove some finitely many edges, right, then if my probability that the uh, cluster 
uh, the cluster containing zero was in infinitely large was strictly positive then even if i remove some of these edges there's still going to be positive okay but you see that if you remove uh, uh, two edges i mean there precisely two edges connecting zero to its neighboring points and you see that uh, you can isolate it right so then for uh, if you take any p that strictly between zero and one you can't hope that zero belongs to any Anyway, so PC of Z is equal to one, and a famous theorem by Kestel in nineteen eighty says that PC of Z two, the Euclidean lattice of dimension two, is going to be equal to half. But what about d greater than or equal to three? In fact, nobody has ever. It's still open. I mean, calculating PC of Z d for d greater than or equal to three, but it's actually simple enough to show that uh, PC of Z two is strictly between zero and one. That is for Z d u. For all Euclidean lattices, I mean, for all Euclidean lattices apart from Z, we actually have a non-trivial space vanish. And next important graph set trees for us. So, uh, so just to recall, a tree is. Uh, I hope everyone knows what a tree is, but just in case, so tree is just an undirected graph which has no cycles. Right? I'll draw a tree for you later on in case that helps. So, uh, a D plus one regular tree is, as you can guess. It's a it's a tree in which the degree of each vertex is going to be equal to d plus one, right? And it's actually again easy to show that the PC of such a d plus one regular tree is equal to one by d. And for more general trees, my PC is actually going to be the reciprocal of the branching number of the tree. But yeah, we won't be needing the branching number just in case someone's familiar. You know what it is. Okay. So we'll pick one of the questions that I had stated before. So was this question that given a graph G, if we pick a subgraph omega of G sampled according to the Bernoulli p percolation measure PP, then how many infinite clusters will it have? So the answer is given by a classic theorem due to Newman and Shulman, uh, published in 1981. And if G is a transitive graph, by the way, so uh, what do you mean by transitive graph? A graph is said to be transitive if given any two vertices x and y, there is a graph automorphism that takes x to y. So, so yeah, if G is a transitive graph, then the number of infinite clusters is constant, PP almost surely, and it's equal to zero, one, or infinite. So I don't have time to discuss uh, what the proof looks like, but yeah, I mean, later if you're interested, we can talk about it. Right. So um, next question is that at P equal to PC, what happens? So this Newman Shulman. The theorem tells us that the number of infinite clusters, uh, irrespective of what p I choose, is going to be one of three values: zero, one, or infinity. Below the critical probability, I know it's going to be zero, right? And uh, uh, beyond uh, the critical probability, I know that it's at least one. Okay. Now, what happens at p equal to this? So, so, uh, so the, the, here's like a brief survey of. Some results for Euclidean lattices. So people, so most of population was done for Euclidean lattices before, right? And uh, so people checked for Z2 first in 1981, and they showed that at, peak, at critical probability there are no infinite clusters. Okay. Then in 1994, again for d greater than equal to 19, they showed that Z for ZD there are no infinite clusters at critical probability. And in 2015, they improved this bound. Uh, this, D, this lower bound for D. Now for D greater than or equal to 11, we know that there are no infinite clusters at D. But the main crux is this that it turns out that uh, the, fa the fact, I mean, the, uh, the fact whether ZD or in particular any transitive graph, whether it has an infinite cluster at P equal to PC, really depends upon its whether it's amenable or not and whether it's unimodular or not. Okay. And here's a long-standing conjecture due to the Nimi and Schramm. And if G is a quasi-transitive graph, by quasi-transitive graph, I mean that, uh, so the automorphisms of G act on G, right? So uh, a graph G is said to be quasi-transitive if the number of orbits is finite, right? Which basically means that if you take any vertex X, then it's belong it belongs to an infinite orbit. Anyways, so G is a quasi-transitive graph, 
then the conjecture says that PC of G is strictly less than one. That is, there is a non-trivial PS1. And in particular, there are no infinite clusters at P equal to PC or PC. So right, I mean, this is just to give you some idea. And uh, the point is, is that, so therefore we know that at P equal to, I mean, if this conjecture is true, which it is true for, uh, I mean, uh, a large class of graphs as probably I'm going to state later. So you know that at critical probability, when you look at your config, your Bernoulli config, uh, your uh, population configuration, there are going to be no infinite clusters. You'll have an infinitely large number of finitely many clusters. So in particular, if you like, it will look like, uh, let's say this guy or this guy. Right? Right. So, right, so here's the upshot. Uh, Bernoulli P percolation therefore gives us a model to pick subgraphs of a graph G at a random, right? So here's the first basic geometric or topological question that we can ask that how does the geometry of the ambient graph influence the expected topological or geometric properties of a configuration omega sampled according to P sub G? This is a very fair question to ask. And among the simplest of such properties is the expected degree of a vertex X. What are some other sorts of properties you can think of? So so some topological properties would be something like, let's say the Euler characteristic of the graph. So of course, I mean, uh, since it breaks down into connected, uh, I mean, it, it into its connected components, then you have to really talk about the characteristic of, let's say, uh, uh, the connected component of some graph, etc. So in fact, you could also talk about the expected Euler characteristic, etc. And many other questions, but we'll restrict ourselves to the simplest of such properties, which is the expected degree of a vertex. And it turns out that, uh, and any information about this expected degree uh, is is like it, it gives you a real advantage. I mean, it, it helps you conclude really important things about uh, the geometry of random graphs. Anyway, so right, so we are at half point now at interlude. So so it turns out that given our an ambient graph has no directional bias, that is. What I mean, I'm going to describe this later, but just for uh, the sake of a heuristic, if my graph has no directional bias, uh, which I'm going to call unimodular for now, then the only property of Bernoulli p percolation, that is the measure that we're talking about, that is required to give a first estimate for this expected degree, is the fact that the percolation measure is odd chain variable. That is, my measure is. Uh, going to be invariant under the action of the automorphism. I'll, I'll define this more precisely later on. And so therefore this basically tells us that, okay, I don't really need to talk about Bernoulli P percolation. I could just talk about group invariant percolation. And what does that mean? That means that means that amounts to choosing random subgraphs of G in an automorphism invariant fashion. So therefore we should restrict our assets, our, our attention to two things this property of unimodularity that a graph ought to have and group invariant population, right? So we will define what group invariant population means. So let again, G be a graph with vertex at V and H at E, then, and let P be a probability measure on uh, the uh, space of configurations, truth body. Okay, by the way, so truth the body is just, uh, I mean, I, I'm denoting zero cover one vector everywhere. So I hope that was clear. And let gamma be some subgroup of the automorphism of so G. Then this probability measure P is said to be gamma invariant if for all events A and uh, all uh, uh, subgroup elements gamma, we have that the probability of gamma of A is equal to the probability of A, right? So by the way, what is gamma of A? So A is an event, it's a collection of subgraphs. So gamma of A is nothing but the collection of the images of gamma, uh, so the images of each um, subgraph in A under gamma. That's what gamma is. And uh, P is said to be gamma ergodic if for any gamma invariant event A, we either have PA is equal to zero, I mean, probability that A occurs equal to zero, or probability that A occurs is equal to one. Then either it occurs or, uh, or almost surely or does not occur. 
So right, these are two facts which you might want to observe later on. That uh, the, in particular, Bernoulli percolation is invariant under the action of automorphism. And if uh, every orbit uh, under the action of my subgroup gamma is infinite, then Bernoulli percolation is also in fact gamma orbital. So even if you don't see the second one uh, right off the bat right now, the first one is quite easy to see because uh, in particular, in order to check uh, automorphism invariance, you only need to check invariance for cylinder sets, right? And you know that on, uh, the cylinder sets are going to be a collection of all these subgraphs in which you know that, okay, precisely k many of my edges are going to be, uh, you know, that precisely k many of my edges are going to be open and some n minus k edges are going to be closed. And the cool thing about automorphisms is that it's going to preserve the number of open edges and closed edges and in fact, the structure of the, uh, the, the configuration. So, homeomorphism. So, from that, it follows that Bernoulli population is automatic. Anyways, okay. So, now we are on to the first thing that we want to define that is the amenability of the graph. So, given a graph G, take any finite subset of the vertex at least, and finitely many, so, or in particular, take any, any subset of vertices. So, the edge boundary of K is defined to be all those points outside k, that is in the complement of k, uh, such that the distance between uh, the, this vertex x and the set k is equal to one, which basically means that you can find uh, some vertex inside k and an edge connecting this vertex inside k to x, right? Having done that, so this literally is the boundary. If, uh, maybe I'll draw a picture later on. Now, having done that, the Cheeger constant is defined this way. You can also call it the edge isobarity constant. It's denoted phi E of G. And it is the worst ratio of the size of the boundary of a finite uh, subgraph of G upon the size of its volume. So it's the worst ratio of the size of the boundary to the size of the volume. So this is basically the number of points in K and there's a number of points in the boundary, right? So this in fact has the Cheeger constant was, I mean, for graphs was, was inspired from uh, an, an, an analogous uh, uh, quantity defined for Riemannian manifolds. You basically have the same thing over here, over there. You, instead of uh, finite subsets, you have uh, hypersurfaces, which divide your Riemannian manifold into two parts. And then you want to look at the worst ratio of the uh, surface area of your uh, hypersurface to the volume that it bounds. Anyways, now G is said to be amenable if the Cheeger constant is equal to zero. Right? That essentially, right, so that basically means that uh, you have you have uh, finitely, uh, you have large enough subsets, subgraphs of your graph G which have comparably very small boundaries. That's what it means. So some small examples. So this is very easy. These are very easy to check, easy computations. Then the Cheeger constant of the Euclidean that is equal to zero. So in fact, for this estimate, you can just take the surface area of a sphere and divide its size volume. So, and then take the limit. So it should give you zero, right? And in particular, the uh, uh, Cheeger constant of a D plus one regular T is going to be equal to d minus one. So therefore you see that uh, the only regular tree which is uh, amenable is um, in fact a copy of z, right? Otherwise all other trees, uh, regular trees are going to be non-amenable. Right, so uh, g is said to be non-amenable if of course the Seeger constant is non-zero. Okay, which brings us to a prime Object uh, kind of example that we're going to look at is a Kili graph. So I guess many of you are already familiar with, with what Kili graphs are. So I'll just quickly go through it. So um, take any countable finitely presented group gamma. So by that I mean that I have a presentation of gamma given by a finite set of generators X and finitely many relations R. And given this presentation, uh, I consider the Cayley graph of gamma as follows. This is noted by gamma of S. So the vertex set of gamma is precisely going to the, all the group elements of gamma. And what is my edge set? 
So my edge set is going to be uh, undirected edges first of all. And what do I do? I pick any two group elements G1 and G2 and I join them if G2 is equal to G1 times S, where S is a generator, right? So in particular, you see that these KLE graphs are uh, regular, right? And in particular, transitive. Why are they regular? Because uh, given any vertex, uh, you have, I mean, the degree of that vertex is exactly equal to the uh, size of my generator. And why is it um, uh, transitive? Because I can just multiply each element on the left by a group element, and that gives me an automorphism. Anyways, so right. So question is this: that so I defined amenability for graphs, right? Now you see that uh, while defining the Cayley graph of a group gamma, I needed to choose a presentation. Actually, in particular, I just need to choose a Gen uh, generating set. So the question is, does amenability define uh, depend on the choice of generating set? So the answer is no. In particular, amenability is well defined notion for finitely generated group. So by the way, so these are some examples of what Cayley graphs look like. So if you take the uh, abelian group Z2, then the Cayley graph of Z2 is just going to be Euclidean matrix. And okay, sorry for the horrible diagram over here, but if you take the free group generated by two elements in B, then it's just going to be a tree, right? It's going to be a tree, a four regular tree. Great. And here are some nice pictures uh, on the hyperbolic plane. So by the way, so I'll, I'll just say where I've taken this figure from because I couldn't have drawn this myself. So uh, from the left to the right, you see that the first one is uh, the free group on two letters. I had drawn this here. It looks horrible, but yeah, this one looks much better. The middle one over here is the Cayley graph of the free product of a uh, copy of Z2. Z2 is just the uh, cyclic group uh, of order two. So free group out of three copies of these guys. And this is just a three regular tree, as you can see. And the one on the right hand side, farthest on the right hand side, is the free, the Cayley graph of the free product of uh, Z, a copy of Z2 and Z3. Anyway, this is just to give you some idea of what these guys look like. All right. So, in order to see why uh, amenability does not depend on the choice of generating set, uh, we need to try and compare uh, when are two graphs, uh, when is the force geometry of two graphs similar? What do I mean by coarse geometry? So here's a quick example. So, uh, so think about the uh, uh, think about the uh, set Z, okay, the set Z, not the uh, graph Z, the set Z. So if you're really close enough to Z, I mean, and uh, imagine it included in the plane R2. Okay. So now, if you're really close, uh, in the, sorry, in, in, let's say you in Euclidean uh, three-dimensional space R3. If you're really close to this set Z, then you will see you'll be able to distinguish between two points, right? You'll see that they're separated, it's a discrete set. But uh, when I say that I'm talking about the coarse geometry, that means that if I go really, really far away, then Z should appear like a straight line. That's what I mean by the coarse property. So, right, so how do we formalize this? So, given a two graphs Z and Z prime, we say that. Uh, there is a quasi, I mean, G and G prime are quasi isometric. If there's a quasi isometry between them, and what is this? So, this is a graph homomorphism uh, pi from V to V prime, such that there exists constants, non zero constants. I mean, not necessarily non, I mean, K needs to be non zero. C can be equal to zero, actually. Constants K and C, uh, for which this inequality holds. So, uh, so, what does this really mean? This basically means that so so take set c equal to zero. If you set c equal to zero, you see that phi is nothing but a bilateral map, right? Bell should not be a really nice map between two metric spaces. So what is c doing? C is when c is non-zero and positive, it's just fudging it up. This c is essentially going to account for the coarse factor over here, right? So this is basically a coarsely bilateral map, if you like, right? That's the first thing that you want. And uh, the second property that you want is that phi needs to be essentially surjective. 
what does that mean that means that if i take uh, any vertex in uh, let's say x prime and d prime then uh, it ought to be close enough in fact uniformly close enough to the image of the vertex at v right so if you to take the image of the vertex at v and at phi and you cover all the points by let's say some epsilon balls where epsilon is constant or fixed then uh, the entire collection covers all of the graph theory anyways so now the fact that amenability is well defined for a finitely current countable group follows from two facts firstly if g and g prime are quasi isometric then g is amenable if and only if g prime is amenable note that the converse is uh, sorry yeah note that the converse is not true right uh, for instance um, uh, talk about let's say consider z and z2 okay the graph z and z2 then both of them are amenable but they are not quasi isometric i'm not going to prove why they are not quasi isometric but it should be like a visually clear and the second fact that we need is that if s and s and s and s prime are two generating sets for a countable finitely generated group gamma then gamma s i mean the kelly graphs the corresponding kelly graphs are going to be quasi so from this it follows that i may be ready for well defined okay so now the amenability of a graph so so this is like a first instance of saying how um uh, some probabilistic probabilistic processes on a graph are uh, influenced are influenced by the geometry of the graph so uh, so we relate the amenability of a graph to its spectral radius so what if we take a graph g and fix a base point and let x and b be a simple random walk on g starting at this base point o then the spectral radius of this simple random walk on g is defined to be the limso present tensile infinity of uh, the 2nth root of the returning probabilities p2 n o comma o so what is p2 n o comma o it's the probability that uh, the simple random walk uh, the simple random walk ends up at my vertex o Uh, after two n steps, right? That's my spectral radius. And uh, so, so just like in the Riemannian manifold case, you have a pair of um, Seeger inequalities that uh, relate the um, spectral radius to the amenability of a uh, to the Seeger uh, constant of a graph. And these are the inequalities, but um, so the upshot is this: that from this we can essentially conclude. That G is non-amenable if and only if the spectral radius is less than one. So this is like one small example. Okay. So um, right. So now we uh, really enter the main uh, layer of our talk, which is unimodular graphs. So prototypes for unimodular graphs are essentially Cayley graphs. So uh, So having taken such some group, some countable group gamma and generating such as, so we've already seen how uh, uh, left multiplication of group elements correspond to translations, right? And it is common to run into functions uh, on the on two tuples of uh, the vertices of uh, gamma, which are non-negative, and a diagonally invariant at the axis of gamma, which means that f of gamma x gamma y is equal to f x y for Any group, uh, group element x, uh, any group element gamma. It turns out that uh, I mean it's very easy to see that any such um, diagonal invariant function enjoys a Fubini-like property. So uh, this is the so so we like to think of f as a mass function. So so f o to f of o comma x is basically so o is by the way the identity of the group gamma. So F O X is the mass that's traveled from the identity to a point X. So this basically says that the mass that has traveled out from the identity is equal to the mass that has traveled in, into the identity. Right. So the question is, is that can we write down such a Fubini-like uh, property for graphs which are not necessarily Cayley graphs? Right. The observation is this that uh, uh, this. So by the way, this equation is called the mass transport equation. 
So it turns out that this mass transport equation can be characterized by the nature of the action of a relevant subgroup of automorphism, right? And how do we, so let's see why that happens. So uh, here's some standard terminology. So uh, given any uh, point X, tab of X is going to be the stabilizer of X, right? The stab of X acting on Y is exactly the elements of stab of X acting on Y. So, having seen that, it I will not be proving this now. It turns out that if you have any diagonally invariant uh, function f, which is I mean, which is also non-negative, then it satisfies a modified mass transport equation. So, in particular, just you just need to look at the equation downstairs. So, this is for uh, Graph which are in fact transitive. Okay, so you see that there is in fact just a fudge factor on the right hand side, which is uh, this finite constant over here, which was not there in the Cayley graph case, right? So therefore, what what should unimodular graphs be? Unimodular graphs ought to be those graphs for which this fudge factor is equal to one, right? So unimodular graphs are therefore graphs, uh, uh, so for, for which the size of Stab x acting on y is equal to the size of stab y acting on x for all pairs. So right, as we saw here, if if the graph gamma is also transitive, then we get back exactly what we wanted, which is the Sobini like property, which we call the mass transport principle. Right. So in fact, uh, uh, you can also observe that. Um, I mean, so this so. The point is, is that this uh, group theoretic, so the, the action action property over here is entirely characterized by the fact, uh, characterized by the mass transport principle. That means that if my uh, if my graph G satisfies this mass transport equation, it's going to be unimodular, and if it is unimodular, it will satisfy the mass transport. Anyways, so we are now ready to try and estimate the expected degree of the vertex in the graph, sampled according to this Bernoulli P method, P sub P. Right. So, so we'll be seeing two kinds of averages. So, um, so take any finite subgraph capital P of G. So, and define the average internal degree to be what? So, uh, take every take each point in X. Uh, take each point X in my in your subgraph K, and compute the degree with respect to this subgraph K. Sum them all up and divide by the size of K. This is the average internal degree, and we denote it by alpha K. And we set alpha g, alpha of g, the graph g, to be the supremum of all these alpha k guys. But the supremum is taken over all finite subgraphs, right? So as it turns out, it's very easy to say that this um, geometric internal degree alpha of g is is constrained by and constrains the Cheeger constant, right? So um, in particular, you have you'll have this relation that the sum of the geometric internal degree. And the Seeger constant of the graph G is exactly going to be the degree of my graph G, given that it's regular. And we are mostly talking about Cayley graphs over here, which are regular, and the degree is basically equal to the size of the uh, generating set. So yeah. So I guess we are a little bit short of time, so I won't have time to go over the proof. It's a really short proof. But um, so given this uh, geometric uh, degree alpha of G, now we also have the expected degree of omega. What is this? So you take any percolation configuration, um, fix a vertex x, compute the degree, and uh, you have a probability measure for this um, uh, percolation configuration, which is, uh, which is let's say, the Bernoulli P percolation method. So then you can compute the expected degree. So these two are in fact related, right? So this is the main theorem that. Um, if G is a transitive and unimodular graph, and P is any automorphism invariant probability measure on the space of configurations, such that P almost surely all clusters are finite, then the expected degree is bounded above by the geometric degree for any random choice of vertex. Okay. So in particular, uh, when, for instance, uh, we do know an example of when all my clusters are almost surely finite. For example, this happens below PC, and for some nice, 
graph, for instance, it also happens at PC, right? So, um, let's see. Right. Okay. So, um, so how do we prove this? So this is going to be proved by the mass transfer principle. So what we do is that we define a function capital F from B cross B cross omega. Omega is equal to two to the power e whole thing. A non-negative function on this side. What does it do? So you take any two vertices x and y and a population configuration omega. Uh, so what do you do? You check whether the cluster of x and omega is finite or not. Okay, if it's infinite, you set this guy equal to zero. And if it is finite, you compute the degree of x with respect to omega, average it out by the size of the cluster it belongs to, and distribute it to all the points belong to the cluster. Okay. So once you have defined this guy, it's actually easy to see that this function, this capital F, is invariant under the diagonal action of gamma. So you set small of f of x y to be the expectation taken over the population configuration small omega. Okay. So, uh, so it again follows that small of f is going to be uh, diagonally invariant. Uh, that just follows from the usual change of variable formula uh, in measured theory, uh, and the fact that my probability measure is of the model of invariant. So then uh, the mass transport principle tells us that these two quantities, that is the mass flow, the total mass flowing out of uh, my chosen vertex O is equal to the mass flowing, total mass flowing into my chosen vertex O. So we just need to compute them. And um, so an easy check essentially tells you that the mass, total mass flowing out of O, let's just probably give one minute to see what this is. So this is small f of ox is just the expectation, right? It's defined here. So this is the integral of f ox respect to omega, integrated respect to gp of omega. Now, by the dominated convergence theorem, you can take the summation inside. And by the definition, you see, by the very definition of f, you see that when you sum it up, you're exactly going to get the degree of omega, right? And this expect, expression, nothing but the uh, expected degree of omega. On the other hand, if you compute the uh, uh, total mass flowing into O, then again it's not very difficult to see that it's going to be the expected size of um, alpha K O. K of O is the uh, cluster of O, and alpha K O, as you remember, is just the um, uh, internal average degree of this cluster. Anyways, our, the point here is just that it's going to be bounded above by alpha. So this essentially gives you proof that the expected degree is bounded above by the geometry degree. Now the point here is just that this degree bound that we have derived is quite evidently reminiscent of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. Why? So, um, so Bar what does Birkhoff's ergodic theorem tell you? That, um, I mean, the discrete version will tell you this, that let's say you have some uh, some measure space capital F and some uh, measure uh, some measurable transformation F. Then, if you have any real measure function, let's say, which is integrable, let's say phi, and if you compute its orbital averages, these orbital averages converge as you uh, uh, allow your orbital average uh, as you take your uh, average over the entire orbit. And in particular, I mean, they converge almost surely, and the integral of these orbital averages is exactly equal to the spatial, I mean, the integral of the chosen function phi over my space uh, m. So as you see, so alpha g over here is essentially some sort of an orbital average. So you don't really have, you don't really have a dynamical transformation over here that gives you orbits. So what's the next best, best thing that you can do? You can take a uh, finite subset, finite subgraphs of G, compute the average internal degree, and uh, take it supremum. In fact, if you like, you could take a nested sequence of uh, finite subgraphs of G, 
uh, which let's say comprise the exhaustion of G. And that should probably give you a much better idea of how this looks like an orbit. And the expected degree is literally an integral, right? So it's a spatial average. So therefore, this is why it's reminiscent of the Markov algorithm here. But um, the point is that for this heuristic to be useful at all, we should be able to churn out many more such forms. Why just the degree of cert a certain vertex? Right? So, so here's a small improvement that like I mean I observed that makes this heuristic more transparent. So I'm just going to state it. The proof is literally the same. So setup is the same thing. You have a uh, graph G, which is transitive and un unimodular. And you have a uh, automorphism invariant probability measure on the space of configurations on G. Now again, suppose that uh, almost surely all clusters are finite. That basically means that if you take any percolation uh, configuration, then it's going to be an infinite collection of uh, finite sized uh, connected components. Then if you take any function phi defined on the vertex set across the percolation configuration set, which is non-negative, it satisfies three properties. First one being that it's invariant under the diagonal action of gamma. Second one being that when, when you fix the, when you fix a vertex X, so when you fix a vertex X, this basically gives you a function on uh, the space of configurations, right? So you want that to be integrable. Phi x should be integrable. The third is, is that uh, these these guys phi are pointwise bounded, right? So when that happens, it's actually really easy to show that the expected value of phi of x comma omega is bounded above by a geometric degree again alpha phi of g, where alpha phi g is um, defined quite similarly. Right. So uh, yeah, the proof, I mean, the proof, proof is literally the same. So we don't have a uh, need to go through it, I guess. So, um, right. Okay, so I mean, uh, I guess I've, I've almost done what I was supposed to do, that I'm a little short of time. So um, if there are any, questions and I'll, I'll be glad to answer them and if there aren't then we could just try and see how uh, how uh, i mean we can essentially take a randomized version of the random graphs and why that is important so that's probably going to take a couple of minutes but i'll first deal with the questions if there are any Um, yeah, I don't think there are any questions. So thank you for the talk. It was a nice one. This is indeed a new hey. topic for most of us. So we had uh, a good introduction to this. So thank you. And, yeah. Uh, join us next week for a talk by Srivatsa Pandelu. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks.